Okay, I am going to uh, record just a few podcasts on the extremes in the Indian uh, monsoon with uh, some uh, uh, process uh, explanations, uh, but we'll mostly look at trends and some of the knowns and unknowns about the Indian extreme, Indian monsoon extremes. I'm sitting outside, there is light, my glasses are photochromatic so it looks uh, darker, but so I'm not trying to be stylish and there is not much wind so the sound should be good as well. Uh, I will pr produce as many podcasts as needed. Uh, it's not a course, just you can think of it as a primer because there is so much discussion and the discussion in the media tends to repeat the messages about extremes without saying what they are and what's happening. So I'm going to try to kind of give you a little background but obviously this is technical so you have to know uh, the monsoon science to uh, some extent at least. Uh, let me start with this book, a uh, couple, few chapters I will use from this book and then we'll move to some papers. Uh, Tropical Extremes, Natural Variability and Its Trends, uh, edited by this group which includes me as well. And the second chapter in this book is by Goswami et al. Uh, focusing on South Asian monsoon extremes. Um, we won't go terribly deep into the processes but we'll allude to the processes uh, by starting with this one where we are looking at interannual variations of the normalized departure of seasonal mean all India rainfall from long term mean. Drought years uh, are indicated by red while flood years are indicated by blue. So daily rainfall averaged over central India with smooth curve indicating long term climatology. So you can see that there is a slight bit of confusion here. This says uh, all India ra rainfall uh, deviation from the All India Rainfall Monsoon. So you can think of this zero line here is the climatology that's been removed of the All India Rainfall. But the floods and droughts are defined by averaging over central India. So it's quite indicative so this, the, this, the conclusions do not differ, uh, change but nonetheless keep that in mind. And what we are looking at is these blue lines which are above wa the uh, one standard deviation of the long term average or red lines which are below the one standard deviation and each uh, of these, some of them have these blue or red circles which correspond to El Nino and La Nina. You are probably already aware, if not you can look up my other podcasts on the monsoon under tropical dynamics and so on where El Nino brings uh, on average less rain over India and La Nina tends to bring more rain over India than the long term average but you can see that there are many years where there are floods that are not La Nina years and there are droughts that are not El Nino years so this is called internal variability and that's critical because usually the predictability or the prediction of the mon uh, monsoon anomalies tend to rely on El Nino prediction which has a good predictability out to 6-9 months or sometimes even 12 months uh, but of course you have to be careful that it's not always the case but we also now know that the Atlantic Nino or the so-called Atlantic m zonal mode is also uh, capable of producing anomalies over the Indian Ocean, uh, Indian monsoon and the so-called Indian Ocean Dipole or the Indian Ocean Zonal Mode also produces strong anomalies like this year 1961 here which was uh, which is one of the strongest floods here which is related to the one of the strongest the Indian Ocean Dipole Mode that happened that year. This what is shown here is also a, a 11 year running mean so that indicates a low frequency variability in uh, the uh, monsoon. Um, so there are decades where it uh, remains above normal compared to the long term average and there are decades where it remains below normal and there are also multi-decadal uh, time scales to these so these are shorter, these are longer and there is what is referred to as the multi-decadal mode of monsoon, MMDM um, <coughs> we'll see what the mechanisms can be because we don't completely understand it the other point I should make also is that this period since about 1960 uh, we are uh, in this 
I hope this is 1961 and not 1957-58, but we can check. Uh, nonetheless, the monsoon here has remained below average of the long-term mean, and there is a trend of almost 10% uh, drop over this period as well. So the question is whether this is still natural variability of 50 to 60 years and there are some claims that monsoon is recovering which of course will take few years to uh, realize but is it possible that the natural mode of variability the multi-decadal mode of variability of the monsoon is being modulated by global warming this is what global warming can do monsoon will not disappear and its decadal variability may not disappear but it may get stretched uh, in time period from 50 to 60 years to maybe longer uh, if it recovers, then obviously we are still uh, in the natural multi-decadal mode. So these kind of issues have to be uh, understood. But nonetheless, these long periods where monsoon remains below average uh, can be considered as what are called mega droughts. Obviously, they will have a huge impact on water resources, food production, economy in general. And you can see that anecdotally, at least, there are more droughts in this period than, uh, let's say, here. Okay, or compare these droughts to these periods. Obviously, wet period has to come with fewer droughts, but nonetheless, if the frequency of droughts increases, then it's something we have to worry about. And we'll see a table where it uh, appears that the number of droughts in this period has increased compared to the previous period. Okay, so these are the kind of issues for extremes, and this mega drought can be considered as a climate extreme as well. Uh, the intraseasonal variability that is referred to in this caption here is shown here, which is for a particular year like 1988, which is a above normal year. The average rainfall should be about 90 centimeter of average over June to September, but this is more than 112 centimeters, so it's a wet year. And uh, the main thing to remember is that there are these intrinsic intra-seasonal time scales in the monsoon. So if you look at the envelope, which is the long-term daily mean uh, rainfall, there are periods where there are uh, rainfall above this long-term average and periods where they are less. So these are called break periods and these are called active periods. And if you look at years which are uh, normal, above normal and below normal, at least anecdotally you can see that the number of active periods tends to be more during a wet year like this one here and the drought periods tend to be or break periods tend to be longer and more frequent than the active periods in a dry year or a deficit year okay so these deficit years here where is my uh, here tend to be typically um, having longer and more break periods, okay? So the main message that we will learn in this is that the extreme rainfall events, which is what we are trying to focus on here, tend to happen almost always in the active periods. Break periods have very few extreme rainfall events, okay? Which means being able to predict an active period with some lead time would give you a better chance of anticipating extreme rainfall events which would of course increase your preparedness disaster management disaster recovery and so on okay and we know now that there is sub seasonal time scale prediction predictability or week two to four predictability as well so that gives us a uh, kind of a time window or a, a time period of the monsoon to look for in terms of extremes so here the frequency of floods and droughts during different phases of the monsoon multi-decadal oscillation looking at different periods this is 1817 to 90, uh, 1890 actually it's this period here it's a, a typo there uh, we look at number of floods and number of droughts and you can obviously expect that when you're in a positive multi-decadal mode you will have more floods than droughts and vice versa so here negative phase uh, fewer floods than droughts and the question is whether that is changing in terms of a negative phase including many more droughts than before so the number of droughts here is larger than anything we have seen in any of the phases of multi-decadal mode uh, previously so this is also something we have to uh, worry about okay 
the season is still made up of active break periods even when you have drought but uh, the number of extremes and the number of break periods and their uh, uh, extent or time scale will be uh, changing <coughs> what can explain the multi-decadal mode of monsoon uh, not clearly understood but some candidates for explaining them include the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation in the North Pacific or the Pacific decadal oscillation in the North Pacific neither of which are completely understood yet either uh, and they influence the uh, multi-decadal monsoonal uh, uh, mode with uh, via teleconnections which means remote forcing of uh, atmosphere or ocean connections okay monsoon multi-decadal mode then can be influenced by them monsoon also interacts strongly with el nino El Nino and La Nina peak during December, January, February, whereas monsoon peaks during June, July, August, uh, six months before. And monsoon is a strong heat source, so we know that it has a strong feedback to El Nino and La Nina. Uh, and El Nino and La Nina have a decadal phasing as well, where there are decades with more El Nino, stronger El Ninos, decades with more La Ninas. So there is potential interaction between them as well as you can see with these arrows here. Excuse me. Of course, the Indian Ocean is a strong candidate. Indian Ocean is a warm ocean, supplies a lot of moisture for the monsoon, most of the moisture, and its uh, SSDs have strong interseasonal, interannual, and decadal variability as well. And these local air sea interactions obviously are potential candidates for multi-decadal mode of the monsoon and um, local air sea interaction. Okay, so we will leave that there and come to the next podcast to look at how active and break periods uh, are related to extreme rainfall events without having ex exactly defined the extreme rainfall event uh, yet but we will start with definitions like greater than 100 millimeter per day greater than 120 millimeter day millimeter per day greater than 150 millimeter per day and so on okay we'll see the details as we go forward